Yes. Hello, Caroline Simon. Hi. You're here for the basket moving on the flower arranging? For the work. Basket moving and flower arranging. Yeah. That's what everybody else is here for. Um, you can have a seat here with Anna. Okay. Or you can have a seat here with Daniel. All right. Or you can have a seat here with. Okay. Okay, I'll sit here. Okay. Nearest the door, fastest escape. <laughs> yeah. Right. Hey, well, good morning. Good morning. You see what it says up here? I use this slide in the UK as well, where my joke um, worked better than here, but. Um, they, they normally manage to work it out after like five minutes of, um, you, you think, how did it take you that long to work out what that actually says in English? Now, I, I do have a theory, by the way, that um, all Swedish is simply English spelt badly. Do you know, I mean, you just have to, if, you, if you're bilingual and I'm not, you'll appreciate it so much more directly and significantly than I am. I mean, just think of how much Swedish is actually English spelt badly. Just, which is exactly what that book in front of you is. It's, um, I'm not even going to say it's English, really. But uh, by the time we've been through it, it will be a bit like an English person trying to read that, i.e. you can work it out. But you do have to think about it. Can I um, pop that into the thingy for you? Uh, one of the things that I think is really important about this week is to not get panicked by the amount of stuff that's coming your way because it is a lot and do not expect it to make sense at the beginning although it should start to make sense I wonder if we can actually click that more in the place. <coughs> yeah that be really like that. it will start to make sense later in the week so you've actually got to work I suggest about three different paces three different focuses. As we go through, minute by minute, you need to understand what we're talking about. And if you don't, you should say, yeah, I didn't understand that. But you can't pass the exam until you understand the relationships between the things. And you're not going to understand the relationship between things until you've seen a significant amount of the content. So who's read it all? Yeah. No. no. Read any of it? No. Small parts. Did you start at the beginning? No, I just picked. That's a good idea. <laughs> if uh, it's probably too late for you guys now, but if you're going to start reading this book, I think it's for page 528 or something. You have to start reading at. It's uh, it's not here. 528. It's um it's where this Swiss bus ticket is. Yeah, no, it's 540. If you're going to start reading this book sequentially, page 540 is the place to start. Probably not worth it now. One of the things you might want to do with it, given that it's such a brick, is what I've done here. Just swirl the edge round, get yourself a highlighter or something, and mark out where chapter 4 starts and ends, and then 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and then where part 2 is, and where the appendices are, and stuff like that. They used to print a little black splodge on the edge on the page, which when you did that meant you could see the tabs, but they don't do it anymore. Uh, and this will help you navigate around the book. And how about the rest of us? All right, over there. Good. So, so this is on a flip chart, but hey, I'm not very good. At if you want to see how bad my handwriting is, go to that um, URL up there, and you can see. But otherwise. Look, here's a picture. Notice what it says here. We're not in here trying to understand the detail. In fact, this picture is uh, incomplete. What we're trying to do is understand the flow. So what we should recognize is that we have something that moves across from the business where we might have something like a business document, a business case, or some agreements, which might be, for example, a contract. Some things that we're going to have to become familiar with enterprise environmental factors or and organizational process assets and they are terms for a large collection of bits and pieces that we will see in the book but if we summarize enterprise environmental factors as politics 
and we summarize organizational process assets as templates. So a project kicks off when either a contract or a business need arrives, and that's going to cause all sorts of stuff to happen. And that's the journey we're going to take, and that's the journey through the, through the whole of this book, but we're going to do the whole of this book on one page. As, a, as an overview. And then every conversation that we have from the end of this one onwards is simply adding detail. So this is the complete breadth, but it lacks the detail. This is the complete detail in the book, but it can't add anything to the breadth. Can you also see up here there's a numbering scheme? So the book starts describing the processes to us in chapter four. You do not need to know the numbering scheme. However, if I describe it to you now, it will serve as a shorthand for us as we go through the next few days and we'll be able to talk about some concepts like this says 4.1. So this is so what we're about to see here, in fact, let's pop it up here. Develop charter is the first process in the integration knowledge area. So the integration knowledge area is chapter four, you don't need to worry about that. Its first chapter, its first process is number one, you don't need to worry about that. All of its inputs have a one. So 4.1, point one, 4.1, point one, 4.1, point one, 4.1, point one. So the point one in that third place means it's an input. If it was a point two, it would mean it was a tool and technique. And if it was a point three, it would mean it's an output. Now a lot of exam questions say the project manager is in this situation. What could you have done to prevent that? So you might be thinking, well, the thing I could have done to prevent that was have a good input. And the good input would have come, so knowing the structure, even if you don't know the numbers, you don't need the numbers, but knowing the structure is useful. So I'm not, I'm not going to put it everywhere. So something either a contract or a business need arrives, and we take account of the politics and the templates and roles and responsibilities, and we run this process called Develop Project Charter. Now, if you were going to guess, or if you've done a bit of reading ahead, what would you think would be one of the main outputs of Develop Project Charter? A document called Project Charter. So if we were going to produce something out of here called Project Charter, what would you think its numbering might be? 4.1.2 2 is tools and techniques. Uh, this is an output. output. So it's 3. And guess what the next number is? Four. It's a 1 because it's the first one. So 4.1.3.1 project charter because it's the first output from this process. In which case, when it arrives over here, what, what sort of thing is it when it arrives over here? Note that these are all what are these to this process? These are all inputs. So when this thing leaves here, it's an output. When it arrives over here, it's an input. It's an input. So it's got a new number at the other end of the arrow. So it's now 4211. So what we've seen here is that this thing developed charter. 4131 is it's, is it's an output. That means if I'm looking through the book and I want to know about stuff, often finding where it's an output is the best place to start, because that's probably going to give us the best description of it. However, it also, unfortunately, means occasionally, where it's an input, they say something new about it. That is a real pain in the... Because it now means, potentially, I've got 25 places in the book where I've got to read up on it. I'll guide you around that. It's not as bad as I've just made it sound, but... So the project charter links, develop project charter, to develop project management plan. So if you were going to guess, what would you think the major output of develop project management plan is? Project management. It would be a project management plan, which we could then also say is a child of 4.2. It's an output, so it's 423, and it's the first one, so it's 4231. And what we should now um, have awareness of is that the project management plan goes everywhere and gets updated everywhere. So that's not going to be what this picture shows us. So that's showing us that this picture is simplifying. But the project management plan requires as input every other sort of plan we can think of. And there's nothing else on this picture at the moment. So you can't have, you can't have produced this thing until you've done everything that's not here. 
although this is saying the first thing we do is produce it, because this is an input to everything else. So what we should learn from that is that the book describes a journey that appears to go A, B, C, D. In fact, we're going A through Z all the way along. A to Z, A to Z, A to Z, A to Z, all the way along. It's iterative, it's cyclic, it's um, many things happening in parallel or happening repeatedly. Now, if we just think about a project, when we've got a project management plan, what comes next? I've got a plan. Simon, have you got a plan? Yes, boss. Right, what are you doing next? Working. I'm going to start working. And that is here called direct and manage project work. So direct and manage project work, what I'm trying to say here is that the amount of effort over time is a big peak of work, but 80% of that peak of work is bricklayers or web web coders or um, electricians or those sorts of things. And a little bit of a veneer, a little bit of a, 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 of a surrounding to that is the project manager doing project management type stuff, which in terms of execution is caring for the team, getting the people to make a team, caring for the team, making sure that the monitoring stuff is, is happening okay and that we're taking control, that we're in control. So we're doing things like overseeing quality. Uh, mostly what we're doing in here is overseeing quality and building the team. And if the team is busy working away, what is the results of their energies? Big clue here, word starts in D, fairly long. Can you read it from there? Uh, yeah, and you need to look on the online one. It says deliverables. So I think it's, I think it's slide, slide four or something in the, in the online version, but you'll see, you, you're going to look at it later. Better to focus up here, here at the moment. So the business or a customer requests something, we get authorization to proceed, that's the charter. We turn that into a plan, that is to say we um, create schedules and budgets and the like, and then we ask the technical people to do the technical work and they create deliverables. Now clearly the focus within directing and managing work is that people focus on quality. So there's all sorts of stuff going on in here to ensure that we get a qu quality product. But when that deliverable comes out of here, then what we specifically do is we ask the quality control process to confirm that that deliverable matches its requirements or its specification. And if it does that, then we can say that this deliverable is verified. So we've gone request from wherever, get authorization, build a plan, whether we're agile or waterfall, get the technicians to do the work to create the deliverables, which we are continuously working upon the quality aspects of in order to confirm those variables, that those deliverables uh, meet their specifications. At which point we can now ask the customer, not if we press that button, we can't, we can now ask the customer to accept them. So we do validate scope. Validate scope is not about saying, is this thing right or wrong? It's because that was the step before. This is about saying, will the customer take it away from us? Will the customer take it off our hands? So it's about acceptance. And if we have an accepted deliverable, what do you think we'd do with one of those? What do you think happens to accepted deliverables? Then we're happy. Then we're happy. And the phrase in here for then we're happy is to close project or phase with the output being final product, service or result transition. So there you go, there's the journey from the beginning to the end of this book. And you need to get this in your mind. Some sort of trigger, for example a contract and or a business case, causes us to do the work to get authorization. And that authorization is in the form of a charter. The charter leads us to do the work to develop a project management plan, which has a lot of detail that we're not seeing at the moment. And when we have that project management plan, the technicians do their work. And Part of the activity or energy spent in, do, in directing and managing project work is about caring for my team, caring for quality, and caring for procurements. Not doing the procurement, but caring for the stuff that's subcontracted. The result of that are deliverables that we must confirm meet the requirement, and then we must confirm that they are acceptable. 
So they go from being a deliverable to a verified deliverable to accepted deliverable. And when they're accepted, they have been validated. So they arrive as verified and they leave as validated. And then we close out the phase. And if the phase we're closing happens to be the last phase of the project, then we're closing the project in total. Does that make sense? Good, because that's the backbone of your understanding. That backbone is embedded in all of the questions like, what should the project manager do next? Or how could we have avoided this situation? How could we avoid this situation is another way of saying, what should we have done beforehand? This picture, the animated version of this picture is in the stuff that I put online. So you have access to this as soon as you manage to get that URL typed in. And if you go there, and, and if you click on the background, you'll get the animations. If you click on the little triangle in the top line, it will go slide by slide. If you click on the globe, it will take you to the navigation. There is actually a lot of stuff that I haven't got to yet. I just want to come back to this. This is the journey through the book, and it shows us how the charter, project management plan, and deliverables go through the book. So that's something that I need you to internalise. Now, when people are undertaking the work, they generate status data. So here's work performance data. And it comes from how many places? It comes from one place. So we get work performance data from one place. Now work performance data is stuff like, have you finished? Not quite. Or have you finished? Yes. How much resource did you use? Hang on, let me have a look. So that's raw data. Raw data has no meaning until we analyse it. So it then ends up in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How many places? Ten. So it comes from? One. And it goes to? Ten. Where they all analyse it. And in analysing that work performance data, they create work performance information. Work performance information comes from? and goes to, okay, so we got it, it comes from 1, goes to 10, comes from 10 and goes to 1. Data, analysed, information, and the difference between data and information is that information is data in context. It has meaning. You can make decisions based on it. So by making decisions on it, we are now in a position to be able to do whatever it is that we need to do in order to run the project. Now, alongside work performance data, we're going to get change requests. And change requests don't just come from 11 places, as this diagram is currently showing us. They come from a lot of places. So change requests come from doing work, but change requests come from all the places where we do analysis and many other places. We also generate... Um, Issues, we update the issue log as a result of doing work, but we'll come back to that in just a second. So we can see work performance data. How many places does it come from? How many places does it go to? What happens when work performance data arrives at a, a control or monitor process? What does it do to it? It turns it into information. So information then comes from 10 places and gets consolidated in monitor and control project work. Where it comes out as reports, there are... So there's one source of reports. It goes to a number of places, such as manage communications, because you want to share it with the rest of the organisation, manage the team, and monitor risk. So work performance data comes from one place, gets analysed in many places, the information is then consolidated to be reports, reports about communicating. Data is raw data, when it's contextualised it becomes information. Information then becomes formatted for presentation and then as a result of formatted for presentation it's shared with people. Which then enables and promotes decision making. Are we okay with that? So we've now seen two journeys. Trigger, charter, plan, deliverable, verified, accepted, transitioned. And data, information, report, communicated. We better put the end of the communications in. 
project communications and some and these organizational process assets that came in here, like our templates, are potentially being updated and shared with the rest of the organization so that everybody is singing from the same hymn sheet into and coordinated. But we have a bunch of change stuff flowing around the picture. So as a result of either doing work or um, creating information or consolidating the information into reports, we have generated change requests. So change requests have come from a number of different places and they all arrive in how many places? There is only one place where change request is an input. It's an output from loads of places, but it's only an input to integrated change control. And in integrated change control, we ask the question, is that change okay? What's the impact of it, and shall we approve it or not? And as a result of that, we may well send an approved change request back to doing the work. So there are two triggers for doing the work. There's either the project management plan or the approved change requests. Now, if an approved change request triggers work here to amend the, the product, then quality control will have to know that that change was approved so that quality control can confirm that the product meets its specification as amended. So there's a little loop there, and we're going to see that loop later again, where it might be easier for you to assimilate it, but it won't be a surprise. So work produces the deliverable, maybe that deliverable as a result of some analysis of the data down here, says, you know what, that's not quite correct, that's not quite what we need or want anymore. So we tell the work to do something slightly different, and the quality control activities also receive that approved change request so that when they come to do the um, verifications in here, they can say, I'm verifying this against uh, an updated specification. And as a result, the deliverable can carry on with its normal journey. It may be that this change that's been approved doesn't affect work that's being done by the team directly in-house, but it affects work being done uh, through the procurements. So it may be that that ch approved change request is going out to whoever our contractors are in order to be dealt with out there. It's also the case that in order to do an integrated um, consideration of the impact of the changes, we need to have a consolidated picture of what the project is doing as a whole. So our work performance reports are not just being communicated to places like managing the team and monitoring the risks, but also monitoring and controlling the changes. So work performance reports is going to more than just the simple three places that I've already shown you, as indeed change requests are coming from more than just a few places I've shown you on there. But we know that change requests only go to one place. And we know that that place, are, they either disappear without sight, actually they go in the change log, or they get approved. And if they get approved, they go to a few places. We can't be precise about that just at the moment at this level of detail. But now we have three journeys. Trigger through to deliverable, data through to control and sharing with the decision-making community, and change request to get to interrupt the flow of the deliverables in some fashion that means that they are uh, more precisely what we need them to be. Of course, change requests can apply to more than just the deliverables the customer sees. We apply change to everything, whether it is project or product related. What did OPA Sorry, OPA. OPA is organizational process assets. And I will take you methodically through all those sorts of things. It's just fitting everything on one page at the beginning to give you an overview. Unfortunately, requires the odd compromise. So we'll see it when we tour. Uh, chapter two of the book very shortly and we'll see it exhaustively. There's an, it's got some internal structure. Roughly, it means roles and, res roles and responsibilities and te document templates. But organisational process assets. So the stuff that we have that we invented locally that make our processes run smoothly. Are you getting there? Good. And Anna, you've got this picture up, I guess, right? And you've worked out that if you click on the background or on the little button at the bottom that says next animation, 
it goes one by one. And if you click the arrow in the top left-hand corner, it goes through the slide without showing you any of the animations. So you can sit in your hotel bar tonight with a, with a glass of wine next year and page through this stuff at your leisure. But this is, this is far from the whole picture because clearly you can't do anything without considering risk the whole time. Risk has a bunch of steps. So we've got to identify it, qualify it, quantify it, plan responses and implement responses. And we need to do that really from the very beginning of thinking of the charter. So when we started this journey, developing charter, the production of the charter was actually dependent or actually intertwined with a whole bunch of other activities, such as considering risks and also identifying stakeholders. Now we saw up here that when we were looking at Develop Charter, it had some inputs, 4.1 business, uh, 4.1, 0.1.1 business case, 4.1, 0.1.2 business case, 4.1, 0.1.2 agreements. Well, if we look at identify stakeholders down here, you can see it's 13.1, but it's got a whole bunch of tools and techniques in it. So 13.1.2.1 is expert judgment. Almost every process uses expert judgment. The pin box says the project manager is accountable for integrating the activities of everybody else but does not need to be expert in what they do. In which case, in order to get anything done, we need experts in every other field. So we need experts in stakeholder engagement. We might have that skill ourselves. Later on, we're going to need expertise in things like controlling costs. So expert judgment is like talking about birds. Do you know what a pigeon is? Sort of small grey and craps on everything. Now they fly around organisations where they're then called the corporate pigeon. You know the corporate pigeon? Appears from nowhere, makes a lot of noise, craps on everything, eats your sandwiches and disappears. Yeah. Uh, do you know what an eagle is? Are they both birds? Are they the same? Okay, well, the, the pinball everywhere says expert judgment. Sometimes it's talking about an eagle, and sometimes it's talking about a pigeon, and sometimes it's a sparrow, and you know, sometimes it's an ostrich. So we're going to see this thing, expert judgment, all over the place. When we get into chapter two, we can go and explore it. It's everywhere. It's different every time we see it, or it's the same, depending on whether you think both eagles and pigeons are birds, or whether you think they're different. And then we've got data gathering, data analysis and data representation here. Those are headings are going to appear all over the place. They are umbrella headings. There are many tools and techniques underneath them. This one doesn't happen to use interpersonal and team skills. I can't remember how many component parts of interpersonal and team skills there are. Like 60. So we're going to have to get used to the internal detail. I'm not going to explore it in this picture. I'm just showing you that actually the inputs have structure, the tools and techniques have structure, and for the tools and techniques we often get a heading which is hiding the fact there's a great deal more detail in the book than we're being shown at the top level. Identify stakeholders creates the stakeholder register. If you had to guess what its number would be, what would you guess? 13 something. 13.1, because it's coming out of Identify Stakeholders, and it's an output, so 13.1.3. The only bit after that is, is the first one. Now, in order to develop the charter, we needed to be thinking about risk, we needed to be thinking about stakeholders, but when we've got a, when we've got a charter and a stakeholder register, and oh look, I hadn't mentioned this previously, there's an assumption log here as well. When we have that log, we actually have enough to start the bit that we've already looked at, which was develop project plan. But when we start to develop the project plan, there's a whole bunch of things. If you look at page 25, the, the coloured handout that isn't, in fact, you could look at the coloured handout because it's still relevant, even though it's, even though it's for the fifth edition. This bit of the conversation is correct. 5.1 is, is plan scope. 6.1 is planned schedule, 7.1 is planned costs, 8.1 is planned quality, 9.1 is planned resource management, 10.1 is planned communications, 11.1 risk, 12.1 procurement, 13.2 is planned stakeholder identification. So as soon as we start to create the project management plan, 
we actually start planning a whole bunch of other areas and we probably can't finish developing a project management plan until we finish planning these other areas. Again, it's iterative, it's cyclic. It's a, 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 um, the project management plan is an input to every single one of these processes, but the outputs of every one of these processes is a component of the project management plan. So there's a start, start, and a finish, finish dependency between this lot. You can't start doing these without a project management plan, but they are all components of their own input. We need to talk about the timing of that. Obviously, have you heard the expression that time is nature's way of stopping everything happening at once? And we need the equivalent within, within our understanding of the PMBOK. You obviously can't do everything at once. The other thing that we should... Um, no, what was I going to say there? We can't do everything at once... Oh, and the PMBOK assumes a waterfall-oriented approach to doing our work, even though it constantly says we live in an agile world and you have to be able to integrate agile and waterfall. The book, the, the page um, 25 logic itself, and therefore the exam questions that match it, assume a waterfall world. So let's go and have a look at that. We know that risk is running concurrently with everything else, so we've got a risk register coming out of that, and that risk register will be a living document being constantly updated and constantly feeding into everything else. But the first thing that we're going to do from the logic of following the book for the purposes of understanding how to address the exam in develop a um, project plan is we're going to go do the steps, requirements, scope, breakdown structure. So we're going to collect or gather the requirements, we're going to define the scope, and then we're going to create a work breakdown structure. And we could do that whether we're in an agile or a, or a sequential world, if we're in an iterative world or a sequential world, but it's a bunch of steps as far as the pinbook is concerned. So when you get a question that says, what next, or what, would have been, what should have been done better to prevent the current problem, that set of steps needs to be in your mind. Now, you don't need to remember that at this point, but by the, by the end of today, stroke tomorrow, that needs to be making sense to you. Its result is a scope baseline. There are hundreds of inputs and outputs in the book. I am showing you the ones up here that you want to internalise. The more you can internalise, the better. So don't, don't, if you did just these, you'd be in a good place. If you do these plus, you're in a better place. But these are the non-optional ones where so many of the others, like the, what's travelling from requirements to scope and then scope to work breakdown structure is a degree of detail. It's not in this picture. You probably want to know it, but it's not as vital as knowing the scope baseline here and what that's about and what it contains and where it came from. If we're working through scope, then we will need to be having some understanding of the skills of our people. So you can't have a good conversation about scope and develop the understanding of scope, uh, particularly in the context of what risks you might be facing if you don't know what people you've got. So we'll be acquiring and develop resources and developing the team. Now when we look on page 25, we find that those are in completely different columns, which is a bit upsetting. So what we need to understand here is that the conversation that we're currently having up here is about the logic of how a project flows. And that logic of how a project flows is reflected in the exam content outline, which is what the exam questions are based on. But it doesn't fit the columns in the book. So what you need to understand is that it's the flow through the project that determines the groupings of the exam questions and the waiting for the exam questions. So you need to say that the lines on this page 25 should have been rubbed out. This lot should not be hard lines between these boxes because the stuff overlaps. It spills out on above, below, to the left and the right of the box. It's a focus area, not a box with hard lines. So as we start to understand what we could do ourselves because of the resources that we've got available to us, we should be thinking, therefore, about what we're not going to do ourselves, which you may know by the make-by decision expression. So if, as 
understanding project scope, we have a conversation about there's a good subcontractor out there who could do that for us. That's making a make-buy decision. So we're now conducting procurements. We're not in. We're not in contract yet. We're not controlling the procurement yet. So over here, but we are conducting. That is to say, we're going through the processes of saying, "Could you do something for me?" Yeah, I know I'll have to pay you for it, but I need it by the. Yeah, you can. Great, thanks. So this is getting us into contracts. In order to be able to take this lot through to a cost and a schedule, we'll need to understand how much of the skills from here. So we'll estimate um, resource needs. Now, if you come across, if you're doing exam practice questions and you come across the conversation about resourcing being part of um, chapter six, part of scheduling, then you're looking at questions from the previous pinbox. They moved this, so this was up, up, up until Monday next week, this is 6.3, and now it's not, it's 9.2. So if you're looking at exam questions and you get an exam question wrong, and you go and look at it, it says, well, you needed to estimate the resources, and that's in schedule management. That's because you're looking at an old question. So it's not you that got it wrong, it's the questions didn't get refreshed. And that's a shame we're going to have this conversation for the, for the best part of the next year. But now I've understood the scope, I've understood what my team might look like, I've understood what resources I might get from outside the organisation or where I might just be able to wrap scope delivery up into a contract for somebody else to do. I've got an understanding of what my resources are, so now I can identify what the activities are and I can sequence them. Notice this is a set of steps again. So exam questions of the form, what next, or how do you avoid. So we, we identify the activities and we sequence them. And because I know the resources and I know the, um, the, the nature of the work, I can determine duration. And if I have sequence and duration, I can determine schedule. And now I have schedule and I could be scheduling using either um, agile iterations, but the book has really been written by a committee that understood what a waterfall use of a Gantt chart was. And while they say, while they protest constantly, we understand that you don't have to do it like this. They don't really write the book with that understanding coming through in all the other paragraphs. So this set of steps, this set of steps, and this set of steps is built, is coded into their thinking even though, as we get to maybe Thursday or Friday, we'll be able to say, you could apply it the other way around. And you say, yes, you can, but that isn't sympathetic with the way it's written. Now, that means we've now got not only a scope baseline, but we've also got a schedule baseline. And if we have a schedule baseline, that is to say a sequence of tasks with their durations using resources, we can now have a conversation about establishing a cost baseline or a budget. So what we can say here is if I know the individual resource costs per task, I can estimate my costs. If I combine the estimate of my costs with my schedule, I get a time phased costing, otherwise known as a budget. And now I have a schedule, a cost, and a, a schedule, a schedule, a scope, and a cost baseline. So now I have everything necessary for this project management plan to be sufficient to direct the technical work. So now we've been through 95% of the content of the book and 100% of its logic and the things that are most important. But it's not exhaustive, because on here I have not got managed project knowledge, I've not got managed quality, I've not got managed stakeholder engagement, and change requests actually in, come out of this lot, which I think is 24 different places, and I haven't shown you 24 places down here. The issue log is input 12 times and it's output 16 times. And I've only shown it to you once here, but it is much more prevalent than this picture is showing. So now we've covered, not exhaustively, but logically, the whole of the pinbox. People sometimes want to do this page again when we get to the end of the course because then you've got all the detail. Now, I don't expect anybody here, if I took the picture away, to be able to say, if I said, so what was down the bottom corner? Well, you might say there were three people singing, but I can't remember why they were singing. So if you keep that somewhere where you can access it, 
we are just going to build out the logic of that now. We're not going to do anything else. Just build out the logic. There is nothing more to cover other than our depth. Okay, so if we were, if we were the Apollo astronauts stood on the moon, we've just seen the whole of the world. You know, everything not described is dark, black. Otherwise all covered. Do we need a pause?